Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Um, welcome to the IUIS webinar series, Immunology Without Borders. I'm Hannah Ostergaard. I'm a professor in the Department of Medical Microbiology and Immunology at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. And I'd like to welcome you to this webinar. Um, I want to mention before we get started that you will have the ability to answer, ask questions. You can enter questions throughout the seminar under the, the uh, Q&A section. And then um, at the end of the, uh, the talk, I'll be able to ask the questions on your behalf. Um, so before, so now I'd like to introduce today's speaker. So today's speaker is Dr. Benedetti, uh, Dave Benedetti. He's a physician scientist and obtained his MD board certification in pediatrics and a PhD at the University of Pavia, Italy. Um, uh, so his clinical activity is focused on the diagnosis and treatment of children with rheumatic diseases. Since 2010, he's been the head of the Division of Rheumatology at the hospital in Rome, a children's hospital in Rome, and his research activity focuses on the role of immuno, uh, inflammatory cytokines. His research led to the identification of novel biomarkers of disease activity and prognosis in several pediatric rheumato rheumatic diseases and the identification of novel therapeutic targets. He designed and led several international clin clinical trials of novel biologicals. The, today, he'll cover present, his presentation will uh, cover clinical presentations and laboratory features of hyperinflammation with a focus on hemangio, uh, hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis and macrophage activation syndrome. The title of his talk is hyperinflammation, hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis, and macrophage activation syndrome. And uh, welcome, Dr. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, thank Anne. You very much Anne. And thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this prestigious uh, webinar series. I've seen some, I, I've recognized several of the names of the previous speakers, and I feel a little humbled. And the, re the reason why is that I am an MD primarily. And although I've worked in a lab with mouse, I, you know, being an MD, I can be a medical doctor, I can be a mouse doctor, but certainly nothing smaller than a mouse has ever come under my hand. And I know this is a, a very uh, experienced audience in immunology. So bear with me. I'll try to go back and forth from mice to humans. So what are we talking about? We are talking about something that was actually identified um, more than 100 years ago, which is the horror autotoxicus by Pearl Ehrlich, who really wanted to make clear that uh, the organism is, uh, is prevented from lasting against uh, the organism itself. Uh, and, and therefore, it derived this concept of uh, horror autotoxicus. However, uh, we now uh, have used this in modern era, applying it to autoimmunity, but now we have recognized other phenomena uh, of uh, uh, dangerous or damaging immune responses, um, such as autoinflammation and, hy and hyperinflammation. Now, hyperinflammation being uh, the, the newest one. Now, autoimmunity we are all familiar with. It's the recognition of self-antigen by antigen receptor of uh, T cells or B cells that do activate a pathogenic response that lead to tissue damage and loss of function. Thyroiditis, it's a typical example. Auto, it's, it's very pretty common. Autoinflammation is a little bit more rare, uh, but 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 the def, the functional definition is activation of the innate immune response in the absence of triggers or in the presence of a trivial trigger. Let's make an example: cold exposure. Um, Cold urticaria is maybe an autoinflammatory disease and is triggered by uh, you know trivial a trivial trigger cold uh, of the innate response. And this again leads to damage to the uh, uh, organism. Now, autoinflammation is a concept that is uh, 
pretty pretty easy. It was derived when the first autoinflammatory disease, monogenic autoinflammatory disease, was discovered, uh, mutating this very gene, which is a sensor of the inflammasome, and this led to a gain of uh, this mutation, a gain of function, and there is increased activation of the inflammasome. A number of inflammasomes have been identified. They tend to um, kind of uh, get in funnel into a one function, which is the uh, cleavage of pro IL-1 beta, which cannot be secreted into IL-1 beta, mature IL-1 beta, which can be secreted and therefore activates the response. And this, this funnel, um, you know, images it's actually reproduced in in clinical uh, in clinical different clinical diseases this for example is fmf uh, deficiency mevalonate kinase deficient uh, mevalonate kinase mevalonate kinase and uh, the syndrome associated with the tnf receptor mutation in very different genes from one of each other different molecular mechanism i'm not going into the detail but all of them ending up in one common target, which was IL-1 beta. And this led to the design of a basket trial a few years ago, uh, which really aimed at antagonizing IL-1. And from this basket trial, we have learned that whatever the mechanism is, in the end, if your target is IL-1, you respond to IL-1 inhibition. I'm not going to go through the details here. Um, you, you, you end up responding to IL-1 inhibition, whatever the mechanism, uh, molecular mechanism of the disease is. And we have learned about IL-1 beta, auto mediated autoinflammatory diseases, and we have learned about uh, interferon, for example, mediated autoinflammatory disease. I, I, I saw you have had a, a, a webinar on, on interferon on type 1 deficiency, uh, but there are also uh, disease caused by type 1 uh, hyperactivation. Now, hyperinflammation is the activation of the innate and adaptive immunity in response to a reasonable stimulus to do so, typically a viral infection. This response becomes excessive and leads to damage to the host. Let's make an example. Uh, this is an example of a young uh, child uh, which presents with fever. At day seven, fever is persisting, has hepatosplenomegaly, increased liver enzymes, and uh, the detection of the Estambar virus is uh, positive in the blood, therefore a diagnosis of infectious mononucleosis is made. Many people get mononucleosis, nothing happens, except that this guy went wrong, and by day 14, fever is persisting, unremitting, he has plenum, significant splenomegaly, significant clinical deterioration, and a diagnosis of HLH, which is that different, that's very difficult word to say, uh, hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis, a diagnosis is made based on the following findings, which we'll go through in some detail, not much, but some detail we have to go through to understand the concept. Now, why, why we talk about ABV HLH? Here it is. ABV HLH is a typical um, manifestation of hyperinflammation, and hyperinflammation has become very familiar to all of you in the last uh, 15 months or so, uh, even more so to pediatricians that have to do with, uh, uh, with Miss C, the hyperinflammatory manifestation of COVID-19 in, in children and adolescents. So this is an umbrella term. We like to use the term cytokine storm, which I don't know what it means to tell you the truth. But anyway, under this hyper cytokinemic stuff, we include a number of things. The nomenclature is continually changing and evolving and is very difficult to keep up with. But just to make you an example, uh, people dying of influenza, particularly of the H1N1 influenza virus, die or die, they do die of HLH MAS. Once again, showing hyperinflammatory features rather than simply dying because of the infection. Now, these are the clinical signs that are typical in a, in a child or in an adult with hyperinflammation. And we talk about HLH and MAS. And the two terms will actually go together because the nomenclature is evolving as we speak. And in a recent consensus process on early recognition of these patients, it became clear that these two, HLH and MAS, have to be used together. Um, so too much of a response, fever, too much of inflammation, increased markers of inflammation, and then damage to organ, which you can see by bone marrow, 
increased LDH or transaminase for the liver. There is inappropriate intravascular activation of the coagulation. And then a marker that we are learning to love, which is ferritin, that is clearly a sign of hyperinflammation. And then you look at hemophagocytosis in the bone marrow. And hemophagocytosis is that phenomenon by which macrophage, bone marrow macrophage eat up phagocytes, uh, other blood cells, as you can see in this, in this image. It's not really diagnostic uh, because it's really present in half of the patient so it's toss of a coin but if you find it it's highly suggestive so what are we talking about are we talking about a group of a disease that we have tried to classify based on the cause and here is the first group of patients the first group of patients are patients with a monogenic disorder very rare and as you can see most of them are caused by uh, defect in genes that have to do with poor forming protein, vesicle priming, or vesicle transport infusion to the membrane or docking. This has all to do with cytotoxicity. Now that's where immunology become, became pivotal in understanding what was going on here. Almost 20 years ago, it was pretty clear that in perforin deficient mice, which are mice who have HLH, if you infect them with the virus, uh, and the model is invariably lethal, if you antagonize interferon gamma, the mice survived. Uh, this was then proven to be true in a number uh, of other models of primary HLH in the future years. And a number of studies, which I'm not going to go through, yield to the simple hypothesis, which is not an hypothesis, the explanation of the mechanism. If a CD8 positive T cells recognize a target cell infected with a virus, it kills it, essentially. This is his um, way. When, when the a uh, killing mechanism is blocked, the immunological synapses last too long, and this leads to um, extensive hyperactivation of the CD8 positive T cells. This, this leads to overproduction of interferon gamma. Interferon gamma activates a, 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 a potentiating mechanism of phagocytosis. These patients never die of infection. They die of the cytokine storm produced by the macrophage, which are hyperactivated from gamma. This is the theory. Now, the point, is this true in vivo in patient? Yes, it is. This is the trial that was published uh, at the end of last year. Uh, using emapalumab, which is an anti-interferon gamma neutralizing antibody, in children with primary hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis, which is children with cytotoxicity defect, almost all of them. And I, I want to make a long story short just to say that this trial recruited patients who failed prior standard of therapy, and these are the treatment they failed. Essentially, all patients receive high-dose glucocorticoids. They use a chemotherapeutic agent called the toposides, and this regimen, it's called HLH204, and there's a survival first line of around 50 to 60%, which means that 50 to 40% of the patient with this disease die at present. Now, in this study, there was an overall response of 63%, uh, which allowed most of the patient to get to hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, which is the only curative treatment for this genetic disease. And you see that survival here is around 70% um, before uh, HSCT or following uh, HSCT um, overall survival, which is actually what matters, how many patients overall survive. This compare favorably with what has been done on, on first line. And this slide just summarizes the fact that we went from mice to humans in 20 years, in two minutes, um, and and uh, now the, the this treatment is approved uh, by the FDA for the treatment of patients with primary HLH that are refractory to standard of care. We can discuss about the safety uh, later. So it's it's really true. If we get if you have a genetic defect in cytotoxicity pathway, you get into these vicious circles in which interferon gamma appear to play an appear to play an important role. Is interferon gamma the only thing? No, it is not the only thing. It's always more complicated than that. Uh, for example, in this study, and we'll get back to CD8 at the very end of the meeting. Um, it looks like the hematological features are dependent from interferon gamma, but CD8 expansion appear to be dependent on uh, a different pathway involving uh, uh, CD25 and IL2. I'm not going into the details, but you can briefly see here what this is all about is uh, CD8 specific uh, CD25 knockout uh, in mice.
So there are other pathways involved, IL-2 being one of the two pathways involved. Uh, this has to do with expansion of myelin cells in addition to uh, uh, interferon gamma. So T cells and interferon gamma are not the only one. Expansion of uh, myelin cells appear to occur and blocking of the IL-33 IL receptors uh, provide some benefit in the model, at least in mice. So um, the take home message here is that yes, interferon gamma is probably involved, but it's not the only one. There are other mechanisms and there are several cell types being involved in these vicious circles. But the one thing you want to try to understand to get better into the mechanism, how do you get there? How do you get to these vicious circles in which, um, in, in, uh, in which, uh, in, um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get it, in, in which your, your, your activation goes on and on. So this is unfortunately something that we have figured out for a very few of the patients, the one, the one patients who carry a monogenic disease. The great majority of HLH uh, down here, they are now monogenic. They are polygenic disease called secondary acquired or reactive HLH in which Based on underlying disease, which can be infections, for example, uh, you get a reaction, EBV being the most common and the most famous one, particularly in Eastern countries. Now, rheumatic disease and inflammation, that's what I do for a living, um, do have, uh, rheumatic patients do have uh, MAS, particularly but patients with one disease, which is common in children, which is called systemic JIA. Forget about the name. Uh, it, it's a chronic inflammatory disease in children with a lot of inflammation. Uh, so one thing that we have learned again is, is that you can actually get to, to your, your vicious circles by here, but you can also get here uh, if you get genetic predisposition to macrophage hyper response. And this, and this is true uh, in, in some rare monogenic disease. The first one has been cloned in 2014, and it's a disease characterized by severe recurrent MAS HLH. Uh, the typical feature of this patient is not IL-1 beta, but it's rather IL-18 overproduction. This patient produce IL-18 even in unstimulated, in unstimulated condition. Uh, this uh, NLRC4 is uh, uh, an inflammasome uh, receptor, but it doesn't cause a lot of IL-1 beta. It does cause activation of interleukin-18. Um, and indeed, in one patient with this disease, using a recombinant IL-18 binding protein, Scott Kanna was able to demonstrate uh, significant efficacy. You see here the beginning of the IL-18 binding protein, and you see CRP and ferritin going down. But what you see particularly is the burden of pre-IL-18 binding protein therapies compared to what happened afterwards, which was significantly less, evidently. This is one single case report. This is another disease that we identified in a very large multi-center study. Uh, two of the four patients identified were here uh, in our hospital in Rome. Um, and this is a disease caused to uh, this specific mutation in the CDC42 genes. Forget what that gene is. It's a small ROGTPase that has to do with actin and inflammasome activation. Again, this patient has severe MAS HLH. And the feature, immunological feature of this patient is increased IL-18 production again. Again, this patient produce huge amount of IL-18 even in unstimulated conditions. So it is very true that you can get here and get through IL-18 production, you can probably fool this, this vicious circle that we have been alluding to several times. Let me go back a little bit. Um, during the last few years, we have learned a lot about interferon gamma, um, uh, measuring interferon gamma in blood, measuring what I will call now total gamma, you'll hear very soon what this is, and uh, of a novel biomarker of increased interferon gamma production, which is CXL9. Now, this is, this is a measure of what we call total interferon gamma. What is total interferon gamma? This is mice in a model of HLH. Uh, it doesn't really matter which model it is. And this is actually a model that was established uh, more than 20 years ago. When you inject an antibody in the blood, the antibody will actually move from the blood to the target tissue. 
it will bind to interferon gamma in this case present in the tissue and really the complex antibody the, the antibody um, interferon gamma comps will migrate back to the blood and therefore you can measure the com the, the complex in the blood this is total gamma bound to an anti gamma and free now, if you measure total gamma in a mouse, um, this is an healthy resting mouse, has very little gamma. You, you administer one single injection of the anti-interferon gamma antibody and you see uh, interferon gamma rising. This is the reflection of the baseline production of interferon gamma in resting animals. If you inject CPG, which is a stimulus for HLH, let's say infection associated HLH in this case, you get a marked increase in interferon gamma production. This is a log scale, and this is approximately 134 fold higher than in resting animals. And this interferon gamma comes from the tissue, is not measurable in the blood in the absence of the anti-interferon gamma antibody that has been injected here. So what happens in humans? In humans, you can have organ restricted HLH in this case this is liver restricted HLH if you do a biopsy of the liver you see plenty of CD8 this is CD8 positive and this is uh, CD68 macrophage that are actually phagocytizing red blood cells in the liver so th this is like hemophagocytosis in the liver and if you look at interferon gamma expression or interferon gamma induced genes expression in the liver you see significant upregulation in the liver of all the patient um, but not of the disease control here. Uh, what you don't see is type 1 interferon being upregulated here, nor the traditional uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines. Therefore, suggesting that there is a selective upregulation of interferon gamma in the liver. This interferon gamma is active. There you can see phosphostat 1 in the liver, uh, but not in the disease control. In this case, is a patient with autoimmune hepatitis, which has a different etiology, obviously. And if you go in the blood, you can pick up CXL9, no gamma, but you can pick up CXL9. This is the day of the biopsy. The patient then gets treated with glucocorticoids, and you see CXL9 going now, probably reflecting uh, the uh, what's, what's happening in the target organ. CXL9 has become really a marker of uh, macrophage activation syndrome and HLH. Uh, this is, was uh, the first paper in which we demonstrated that CXL9 was increased during MAS, but not during the underlying systemic inflammatory disease. And as you can see here, CXL9 during active inflammation is flat, but when you get into MAS, CXL9 is significantly related to ferritin. And I alluded to the fact that ferritin is the best marker we have of hyperinflammation. It is also true that not only CXL9 is related to ferritin, but is related to other clinically relevant laboratory abnormalities that we use during MAS to evaluate disease severity and activity. However, it is not correlated in the patients that have active inflammation but not active hyperinflammation as the MAS patient. So what happens in the patient when you give them apalumab? That's the point. So let me, let me guide you through these slides. If you give emapalumab to a patient, this is an HLH patient, you see total gamma, the red line, significantly increasing over time. At the same time, you see CXL9 going down. Here is the same thing. You see total gamma going up and CXL9 because that gamma is bound to the antibody and therefore this, this gamma is neutralized, your CXL9 going down. And what is even more interesting is that your decrease in CXL9 precedes the decrease in ferritin, your preferred biomarker of hyperinflammation. Therefore showing that there is a a tight relation between CXL9 and interferon gamma, bioactive interferon gamma. So if this is true, if total gamma at 48 hours reflect the production of, tot of interferon gamma in the body at baseline, it is possible that baseline CXL9 is related to gamma. And this is indeed the case. There is a direct relation between the amount of gamma produced and the amount of CXL9 measured in the blood. And this really is paralleled by the response to treatment. Your ability to respond is 
proportional to your CXL9 levels at the end of treatment. Uh, so body production of interferon gamma can be estimated by measuring a mapaloma bound interferon gamma. CXL9 spills over from inflamed tissue and it is a biomarker of interferon gamma production. Um, so it is true also that if you have this disease, you, your gamma plays a major role. It is. Uh, in the original description of 2014, CXL9 was found to be present during MAS flare in NLRC4. And not surprisingly, when we looked at CDC42 patient, the high level of CXL9 were related to the levels of ferritin in the patient with CDC42 disease. So based on this observation, what we knew about uh, IL-18, which is known to induce interferon gamma, we wanted to test whether sera of patient with NLRC4 induced interferon gamma when called when added to a PBMC of healthy donors. And this is the case, but only if you are at IL-12. And we all know that IL-18 alone does not induce interferon gamma, but it's a very good co-stimulus together with IL-12. More interestingly, if we use an anti-IL-18 receptor antibody, you see that the ability of the sera to induce is completely neutralized, again suggesting that bioactive IL-18 in the serum is able to induce interferon gamma. This is also true in mice, and for the sake of time, I'll skip quickly a part of this slide, just to say that if you have unbalanced IL-18 binding, IL-18 activities by knocking out the inhibitors, you get easily uh, HLH. Uh, and in these models, again, interferon gamma neutralization improves ferritin and improves, for example, uh, transaminase, as, as shown here. So we treated three patients under compassionate use regimen with very high level of IL-18. They all had high level of CXL9. They had a long lasting disease course. And to make a long, a very long story short, all three, they were, they were treated uh, in very severe condition during HLH flare, two had, had active sepsis, uh, had active in infection. Uh, they all achieved very rapid control as shown here by the level of ferritin who decrease rapidly in all the patients treated with, with emapalumab. So this is probably true also, but what really matter for us, it's down here. It's not the three to 10%. We have to rechange this classification because those two diseases are not in here. We'll make it, but it's actually 90% of the patient have polygenic disease. And as a rheumatologist, we think that the background inflammatory activity leads to some uh, to, as a role in leading the patient again into the same vicious circle. And there are evidence suggesting that this is the case. For example, um, if you have a mouse uh, that overexpress IL-6, which is a typical feature of systemic JIA, and actually if you use IL-6 inhibitors in this patient, they respond very well inflammation-wise, not MAS-wise. If you, if you trigger an infection using LPS, well, if you mimic an infection using LPS or poly-IC, you see that the IL-6 IL mice die, and they die again with the usual cytokine store, ferritin, transaminase, uh, neutropenia, and, and, and decrease in platelet. Um, in vitro and in vivo, one can demonstrate that actually uh, IL-6 uh, inhibits the generation of NK cytotoxic activity. This is true in poly-IC treated mice, as well as in human culture with PBMC, in which if you neutralize IL-6 production by your feeder cells using an IL-6 inhibitor, you get a very nice induction of NK cytotoxicity. So IL-6 may be involved. Another cytokines that we have already alluded to is IL-18. And again, the patient who have MAS, they tend to have higher, higher IL-18 level. Um, and again, this is potentially important. One patient, again, only one, treated with recombinant IL-18 binding protein, the same drug that I alluded to before. And again, some effect not really a complete effect, but some therapeutic effect in this patient with the ability to reduce glucocorticoids and, you know, more easily manageable episodes. Not a miracle, but better than nothing, to tell you the truth. But the real problem here is this shaded, I don't know how to call it, um, this shaded uh, thing in which, you know, genetic predisposition, background inflammatory response, and the infectious triggers, they all mix up together, but somehow they lead you in here.
and we don't really know how this happens exactly, can we treat it? Well, yes, we can. This is again the model of MAS in IL-6 over expressing mice I alluded to before. Uh, what you can see is increased interferon gamma expression in the liver of these mice following LPS administration, increased expression of CXL9. And if you neutralize, with uh, an interferon gamma antibody. Again, you see uh, all the mice survived, as shown up here, and uh, no death, and your ferritin decreases sharply following interferon gamma neutralization. So again, in the mice, you can do it. Uh, the mice are even, you can play around with the mice and just demonstrate how your perforin knockout genotype interacts with your IL-18 overexpressing phenotype two different pathway converging in the slides that you have seen before. And actually, uh, these two genotype not surprisingly interact. And if you are IL-18 transgenics and, for example, perforin knockout, the severity of your splenomegaly is marked. This is anemia. This is a lot of interferon gamma again uh, and a lot of IL-18 again. Therefore, suggesting that these genotypes do interact and they may interact in that shaded triangle uh, circle that I alluded to. What it does happen is that this interferon, this hyperinflammation appears to be interferon gamma dependent again because neutralization of interferon gamma, uh, you know, uh, ameliorates the clinical symptoms of the mice. Back to humans. If you look at humans, uh, whatever the form of HLH you have, it is MAS in rheumatic disease, it is infection associated or genetic monogenic primary HLH, your CXCL9 is always high, suggesting that interferon gamma may be a common pathway for all the diseases. Is this the case? Well, yes, probably. These are data in mice showing that in different mice models, Interferon gamma production is always high. Uh, the, those are all models of secondary HLH, not the cytotoxic models that I have here. Um, and if you neutralize it, there is always benefit. Therefore, suggesting that interferon gamma blockade may provide benefits, even if the mechanisms are very different from cytotoxic defect. Now, that's why we designed a couple of years ago an open label single arm study to evaluate patient with MAS in the context of systemic JIA and see whether neutralization of interferon gamma uh, was therapeutically helpful. Uh, this is a preliminary interim analysis of the first nine patients. CXL9 goes down in all the patients. Um, I, I'm not going into the details, but again, we defined as response complete response. When you go for a targeted treatment, you want to have a very ambitious outcome. Otherwise, uh, it's not worth it. Uh, all the patients achieved complete response at week eight, which is very promising for the final analysis, which is being performed right now. This is ferritin. You have seen this a few times. This is platelet going up uh, and liver enzyme going down, for example, median values of, for all the patients. So, it is, it is working uh, and it is, it is, uh, it is probably, uh, 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 again, it is probably interferon gamma being one, at least one of the pathogenic uh, mediators of another form of HLH, which is MAS in, in systemic, in systemic JIA. Uh, there are here and there some case report. This is a case of a patient with the same disease that is that in children is called systemic JIA. We use different names, which is a shame. Uh, but again, you see that when the patient started emapalumab, this little E, uh, for example, glucocorticoids dose went down, uh, the uh, liver enzyme went down, uh, this is ferritin going down, and before uh, the ferritin did not respond despite um, several other treatments that were used in this, in this patient. This is another case. This is an ABV induced. We, we end where we started from, EBV induced, uh, child with very active um, ABV infection are responsive to anything you can think of, including a B cell killing. When Mapalumab is started, a little arrow here, you see a neutrophil going up, platelet going up, and in impressively enough, the number of copies for ABV dropping and the number of copies of CMV dropping significantly. The patient also had 
the active and responsive CMV infection. So one could hypothesize actually that it doesn't really matter how you get there. Once you are here, it's going to be interferon gamma. Well, it's not that simple, obviously. And, and there are a few things that I mentioned before, like IL-33, IL-2. Uh, maybe in, even uh, T cells can be target, additional target of this uh, in this disease, in this hyperinflammation. I cheated when I showed you these slides because I omitted this. In this model, it was pretty evident that depleting CD8 positive T cell was as effective as neutralizing interferon gamma. And actually, again, almost 20 years later, we now know what these cells are. This appeared in April 29 on blood from our friends in Cincinnati. And what they did was a very simple experiment in which they identified the CD3 positive, uh, CD8 positive, uh, CDA33 HLA-DR expressing cells as being markedly clear increase uh, in patient with HLH. You see here the num the, their numbers in HLH patient, and what you see here is the AUC, which is almost perfect, um, that really provides a distinction between early sepsis, the normal response, from the hyper response of HLH patients. These cells, by the way, produce interferon gamma and other cytokines, incidentally. Um, we have done the same, uh, really, uh, luckily enough, in secondary HLH using a very simple getting strategy. I'm not going to go into the details. I don't think I need any explanation here uh, with this audience. But again, you see the same population in a patient with active inflammation, the same population very high in a patient with MAS, which is hyperinflammation on top of this disease here. And there you see infection associated HLH. Again, very high numbers. And if you look at the total number of patients seen, you don't need to be a statistician here. This is this three group of patients which have MAS, infection associated HLH, or other secondary HLH. They all have increased numbers of this population of T cells. Now, another possibility is actually, and I will be done in two minutes, is to target the J. JAK1, JAK2 uh, pathway. This is something that has been published for the first time in 2016 in mice, and there are some initial experience in humans uh, which are interesting. Um, now, inhibiting Janus kinase in vivo in patient is not as simple, apologies, as targeting a single cytokine. There are several forms of JAKs. They are all conserved and non-redundant. And if you do the genetic deficiency, uh, this leads to severe clinical phenotypes, both in human and mice. And the reason being that JAKs are essential and conserved for several receptors, uh, even worse, family of receptors that do uh, transduce signals for a number of immune cytokines, the IL-6 group, all the growth factor, um, type 2 interferon, type 1 interferon, you name it, even the anti-inflammatory cytokine IL-10. So it's really more complicated than, than targeting a single cytokine. So the philosophy here is keep in mind that you cannot block the JAK pathway completely, patient will die. Uh, the idea is to reversibly reduce the activity, but there is no uh, single JAK inhibitor, which is specific for one single receptor family. So when you inhibit this family, you are getting some inhibition of or from the others, and it really depends on the profile, the affinity of each single uh, JAK inhibitor to the single JAK isophore. Very complicated to understand, to tell you the truth. However, because as MD, medical doctor, we are simple people, we like to do simple things. So this is a trial in mice uh, that, that I alluded to in which they've used an anti-interferon gamma antibody, uh, the white square and the uh, ruxolitinib, which is a JAK1, JAK2 inhibitor. And as you can see, survival is almost similar between the two. And if you do a shorter treatment, survival with Ruxo is it's, it's a little bit better than longer treatment. Um, Ruxo may be toxic in mice. Um, it took a little bit of time to understand what is one of the potential mechanism of this observation, essentially linked to the fact that uh, 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 Ruxolitinibs appear to uh, restore the apoptotic potential of T cells in, in mice in vivo, in perforin knockout mice in which HLH was induced, which I think is of potential interest. Uh, 
glucocorticoids are the standard of care for these patients and if you can add something that synergizes with them and doesn't interfere too much with interferon gamma neutralization this is of potential interest and this is again the therapeutic synergy of uh, DEXA glucocorticoids and RUXO uh, in the treatment of mice, again, percent survival. And you see that uh, really it, it is when you use RUXO and DEXA, the mice are, are significantly better. Here you see ferritin level. So um, some cases coming out, very difficult to interpret because this is not at the setting of control study. These are long-term, open-label, complicated studies, but you see some response here and there suggesting that this is really a target. So in summary, we have talked about upper inflammation as an umbrella term. Uh, these two diseases, HLH and MAS, are the prototypic hyperinflammatory syndromes, and we have learned about the role of T cells, particularly CD8, and monocytes macrophage discuss the role of gamma mouse and humans and discuss the initial clinical experience with the neutralization of humans that it really is really getting these experiments into everyday practice and we know there are options for the future particularly target specific t cell population which is doable now and targeting the jack one and jack two pathway and i'd like to leave you with this diagnosis which is actually probably a patient with systemic GIA who died of MAS. Um, there is arthritis here, arthritis here, and arthritis here. And Caravaggio used to paint from dead bodies. So this child probably died of, HMA, of uh, MAS. Here is splenomegaly, uh, puffy eyelids, peripheral edema as, for, as per capillary lock, shock syndrome, as well as yellowish color uh, because of liver failure. Um, but I, I like you to remember these clinical signs if you ever are practicing, really. These are important because this issue is being underdiagnosed and the mortality rate is still unacceptable. For a child, it's much better to get leukemia rather than getting HLH. And this is um, where I would have liked to give my seminar. This is the view from our hospital to Old Rome. Thank you very much for the attention and I'll be pleased to take any questions. And you need to unmute yourself. You st I st oh. I can't. Uh, yeah. No, no, go back. I think you're fine. I, I, can you hear me you now? Are. Yes, something okay. was wrong. Okay. Um, thank you for a really interesting talk. That was uh, uh, amazing. Uh, we have a number of interesting questions related to this. I think one that may be... Um, timely right now is uh, whether anti-gamma interferon treatment may help reduce hyperinflammation in COVID-like diseases? Ah, that's a good question. Actually, at the very beginning of COVID in uh, uh, April 2020, uh, we designed a study which involved IL-1 inhibition and imapalumab. Um, and Akina and Emapaluma are from the, from the same company, which made things relatively easier. Uh, however, the trial was uh, based on some hyperinflammation parameters uh, at entry. The trial was stopped, uh, unfortunately, by the company uh, a little bit too early. Uh, and really, there was no time to understand whether it worked or not. CXL9 is increased, but it's not that increased. You know, a posteriori, we learned this. And the other thing is that CXL10 is really increased. And CXL10 is a marker of type 1 interferon rather than type 2. They kind of overlap. But CXL9 is pure interferon gamma with very little effect from type 1 interferon, from interferon alpha. On the contrast, CXL10 is a mess. Uh, and therefore, it, it's, it's, bit, it's a bit complicated. You know, I've heard of Miracle with Emma Paloma, but I don't trust Miracle. Um, therefore, I can't answer your question. Unfortunately, <laughs> very honestly. Thank you. Um, so how do you diagnose HLH in a setting where you have a lot of HIV and tuber tuberculosis? That's a very smart question from a very smart clinician. Um, I don't know who he is or she is, but that's a very difficult question. So the point is that, that I draw a line between the vicious circle and whatever was before on the left in my slides, okay? There's no, not such a, a thing as a line in biology. It's always a continuum 
of events leading leading to the final outcome okay so hiv and tuberculosis uh, some of the hlh physician will call them hlh mimics so they induce interferon gamma they have increased ferritin but they actually if you treat the underlying infection it will go away the hyper response is not um, self-maintaining in the absence of the triggering disease uh, behind it or the underlying disease below it so it's complicated how do you diagnose it i i really don't know and how much anti-inflammation do you want to give to this patient? It's a very difficult choice that you have to make on a patient by patient basis. It doesn't happen too often. I've seen one HLH triggered by HIV in my life and maybe two or three things that look like HLH. You have to keep in mind, however, for example, that there are interferon gamma receptor uh, deficient humans. They are susceptible to infection by mycobacteria and they have feature of HLH even in the absence of gamma activities. So again, it's complicated. I'm not saying it's that simple, okay? But as physician, you can do one thing at a time. So it's good you, that you can neutralize one cytokines, or it's good that you can label something as HLH. But then it gets, we all know it's more complicated than that. So I'm gonna to skip to a question that I'm interested in. Um, and uh, I work on CD8 T cells. And, I and know. <laughs> Um, and there's a question here, what about NK cells, which also express um, perforin? What is their role in, uh, in I, I, this? I, I missed a piece of your question. Can you repeat it? Sorry. What, it, uh, what, what about the contribution of NK cells? You talked about CD8 cells yeah, uh, making initiating and, and ILC1s. Yes, yes, they are both important. And you know better than that. But again, as physician, we like to have it simple. So, for example, in NRC4 disease, is more NK than CD8 positive T cells. Who knows? In in uh, in HLH, I, I really don't know. I don't know, and I don't think that it was looked at very. I, at least I don't know if it was looked at. Again, cells are smaller than a mouse, so I'm. It's not for me to be an expert in these things. Um, uh, innate lymphoid cell is a very good question. I know the answer. We just looked. Um, we should have thought about it before. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you a question for me, actually. You mentioned IL-2 just briefly uh, when you were talking about the, the vicious cycle there. Uh, what do you think the contribution of IL-2 is to, to the whole cycle? I, I don't know. Um, the, the, in mice, it works by genetic deletion of the CD25, of, of the IL-2 receptor. Uh, in humans, um, there has been attempt um, neutralizing uh, the IL-2 receptor. There are monoclonals available, therapeutic monoclonals, with very little efficacy. However, these are always relapsing refractory to, to standard of care treatment, usually primary HLH patients. I, I, I think I won't close the door. I just I think we need more data and we need to understand more what we can do. Ideally, I'm tempted to target the CD8 T cells. Okay, makes sense. Um, Maybe. <laughs> um, so another question, uh, does blocking interferon gamma also attack the immune-mediated metabolism and whether the uh, kinurin pathways help the tissue from damage and whether change in microbiome component in patients also contributes to the dampening of the pathogenic inflammation. So I guess the, the question is really, what is the, the role of the, is there a role of the microbiome in this whole um, interferon blocking? I wish I know. However, um, we had a patient uh, that we couldn't treat with nlc 4 induced disease. His MAS flare was very well controlled by uh, imapalumab, 
However, he had uh, uh, he, he carried a, a, a multidrug resistant pathogen in the gut. He was having several sepsis, and all these sepsis triggered HLH flares, severe flares. The patient risked his life a couple of times, and eventually, uh, based on a very poor microbiome, we fecal transplanted him, and he went very nicely from that very moment. Um, the in you have to keep in mind, however, the NLRC4 is expressed very highly in the enterocytes, and it's, it plays a major role in recognizing flagellin and rotaviruses, you know, which are you know enteropathogenic bacteria and viruses. And therefore, maybe it's just because that given inflammasome had a, had a specific role in the gut. So I won't conclude. FMF, in, in other diseases, there is a clear role. I mean, the microbiome changes the inflammatory background. I think it's too early to conclude. We just don't know what they do. So there's the possibility, but yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. The possibility is one thing, data is another thing. Yeah. Um, another question is, is there a role uh, for combined blockage of more than one cytokine, for example, IL-6 and IL-18, and does it increase susceptibility to infections? I cheated. I didn't tell you one thing that I'm actually allow you to treat. There is a B-specific antibodies targeting IL-1 and IL-18 together, which has been, uh, we, and the trial is published on clinical trial. is announced on clinical trial.gov since a few weeks. We are starting the trial, and we really look forward to that group of patients with macrophage, hyper response, and hyperinflammation triggered by inflammasomes uh, by targeting two cytokines at the same time. Um, it may, it shouldn't be dangerous, not too much, at least because there are experiencing with the, the IL-18 binding proteins and uh, IL-1 inhibition with two different drugs in the same page. So it should be. I wouldn't, I'm, I'm not sure there is any experience in using IL-18 on top of IL-6. Okay. Um, is there any role of IL-6 blockade in HLH MAS as we do have a role for IL-6 receptor blockade in SJIA? Unfortunately not. No IL-1, well, IL-6, no role that we know of. IL-1, maybe early at a very high dose, uh, at least contributing probably to dampening that part of the hyper of the inflammatory response that maintains and fuel the the, the vicious circle. Uh, but but the data you can have you can have MAS HLH when you are being treated with L1 inhibitions. Therefore, it's it's not crucial, but it helps sometimes. Okay, so what is the best indicator to evaluate the cytokine storm situation in a patient? Ah, lovely question. We don't know. I think we are back to square one. We are back to a little bit of cytopenia, a little bit of transaminase and ferritin. None of them is diagnostic per se, but if you see them all together in a, in a, in a, in, in a pattern, then it becomes diagnostic. We love CXL9. We do CXL9 routinely. Uh, with, a, with an FDA validated uh, assay now. Uh, we, do, we do neopterin, which I think is potentially interesting, is very old. Uh, Hannah, you may remember that from the very old time of interferon gamma, but it's actually coming up again. Neopterin is nice, probably. Um, um, and I guess this CD38 uh, HLH DR uh, positive uh, population is is of potential interest. But it does really distinguish between hyperinflamed patients and of the different nuances: infection associated, primary monogenic, uh, rheumatologic disease associated. It looks like that may be a common thing uh, that may be useful as a biomarker to identify hyperinflamed. It's really trivial. Even I, I can understand the gate setting to do that. It's trivial. Okay. Um, is there any relationship between HLH and, and PIMS in, in pediatric COVID-19 patients? Because they have the same uh, Not exactly. No, they don't have the same phenotype. They are, I think, PIMS or MIS-C, whatever you want to call it, um, it's, it's a form of hyperinflammation. It comes, it, 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 it has onset after the infection, 
weeks after, which is typical, two weeks later, you get in trouble because your response didn't go back to normal. And the ferritin is by far not even closer to what you get in classical HLHMAS. It's a few hundreds, maybe a few thousands, but nothing like the hundreds of thousands you have seen in my slides. And and the cytopenia is, is a little bit of cytopenia. It's a lymphopenia. The lymphopenia is profound. CXL9 is increased, yes, a little bit. We haven't looked at this population, not yet. We should. Uh, um, we, we are actually doing it, but I don't have the data to share with you. Um, I think it's hyperinflammation. We have to, we have really to try to understand the mechanism of the different nuances of hyperinflammation so that mm -hmm. we know how to target them. Really with PIMC, provide the, the PIMC, PIMS or MIS-C, provided you recognize it uh, early, glucocorticoids are sufficient. The great majority of the patient respond nicely to glucocorticoids. If, if then it gets too late, then it's a problem, yes. Okay. So apart from platelet count, are there any other platelet parameters that associate with hyperinflammation in these syndromes? N n don't know. Don't know the answer. Don't even know if, if somebody looked. My ignorance, apologies. Okay. So uh, are there any data from human studies for pathogenic role of free or label, labile heme uh, released from hemoglobin or the heme metabolism pathway uh, that are involved in HLH or MAS? Not that I know of in humans, but again, my ignorance. But there are data in mice, yes. Okay. Lots of questions here. Oh, no, keep coming in too. <laughs> well, we, um, and let, I don't know when we are cut, but <laughs> when we are cut, we are cut. Yeah, we, have, we have a few, more, a couple more minutes. Um, how about the role of TNF uh, receptor one in driving down the disease pathology? And uh, well, let's just leave it at that. Oh yeah, I, I read the second part. It's even worse. I, I don't yeah. know. I mean, it's yeah, okay. it's it's. I don't know. Okay. Um, I probably I, you don't know, but do these genetic mutations provide any evolutionary advantages? Not that we know of. We are just we have just found last years why why having FMF, having fe Medi familiar Mediterranean fever is uh, is an advantage. It it it, it makes you uh, less susceptible to Yersinia pestis. So ah. some of them might. Oh yeah, this is a cell paper published last year. Fascinating thing about some some toxin from Yersinia pestis. They're called YOP. Yop E and Yop M, who actually, they, you know what they are, <laughs> and they, I, I didn't know what they were. They, they get into, they, they actually inhibit, they, they inhibit pyrin and mutated pyrin is the protein mutated in, in FMF and pyrin is, turns out it's a, it's a receptor for an inflammasome uh, and the mutated pyrin are less sensible to the inhibitory effect. And there was no pestis in the Mediterranean and pestis, the, the, the plague was always in Northern Europe where there was no FMF. Interesting. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, pest, but FMF is a common disease, actually. Yeah. Um, I think we, we covered that. Um, I think a lot of the questions are kind of similar to ones that you've answered already. And this may be a, a good time then. Um, all right, here's, here's one that might be interesting. How, how, how can we explain the distinct secretion roles of IL-18 and IL-1-beta in uh, hyperinflammation? Oh yes, that's a very good question. I think yeah. I think there are two the two um, possible interpretation. One is no, actually it's totally the same. Is the cell type and the location, the organ in which these things occur. So if some of the inflammasomes are more expressed in certain cell types than others, we we tend to believe it's only the monocyte macrophages who express 
inflammasomes in, in the sensors, but this is not the case. Mu mucosal cells and skin cells express inflammasome, and and it's pretty obvious why they do, because these are danger. I, I, I you know are sensing danger or or pathogen or sensing pathogen molecular path platforms. So it really depends on the locations and in the amount of cytokines and what are the cytokines expressed in that given cell types if you have a lot of message rna for l18 then your your k space one in the end will cleave l18 because there is no l1 beta to cleave uh, so it, it is actually we have actually to try to understand the molecular signature of an l1 beta mediated disease versus an l18 mediated disease and we don't have a clue really don't have a clue now mm -hmm. and although we go for biomarkers extensive gene expression profiling we haven't been able to find a biomarker for example for l1 beta production with interferon gamma we have been lucky because cxl9 is relatively specific for interferon gamma um, i don't think neopterin is as good as but is interesting um, and there might be others coming Okay, that seemed like a pretty good place to wrap up here. Um, I wanna thank you again for an absolutely wonderful talk. And um, I certainly learned a lot more about, I knew a bit about HLH before, but I certainly learned a lot more. And I'd also like to thank the audience for all of their excellent questions and uh, the discussion that followed. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hane. Thank you for the patience. Thank you for the nice words and uh, Thank you very much for listening to all of you and for the tough questions, which I'm not sure I should think about. <laughs> okay. Stay safe and yes. enjoy the better period is coming. I hope we can be optimistic a bit. Yes, and uh, we have I, uh, more IUS webinars on its way, so watch for the, the announcements for the next ones. So thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.